Hello Premium Queen, how are you doing today? Amazing, I believe. I have been meaning to do this for the longest of times and the perfectionist in me, the spirit of excellence in me has made me to keep postponing this but today I'm like, you know what? I would do this today, irrespective of how ready I feel or how I'm afraid <laughs> I feel to come to you um, this day. My name is Ijo Mandukwe, the CEO of Bubes Foods Limited and the lead brand strategist at Leap to Limitless Global. I am popularly known as Wanya Kamo, but I am the transformational clarity queen. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This is my first episode and in this episode, I'll be sharing my story, my journey and my assignment is simple to inspire you to dream, to inspire you to create wealth, to inspire you to say to you that you can have it all in the midst of the storm, to say to you that your dreams are valid, to say to you that you got this. I remember growing up as a child, I used to love to read. I would literally hide in the restroom to read, you know, just so that nobody would disturb me. I would read your every series in Famous Five um, by Enid Blyton. And I'm sure that some of you would know um, the book. Um, then at some point I, I transited, of course, I had outgrown um, the Famous Five series and all those. I, I transited into books by John Grisham, Sidney Sheldon, and all of those, you know, very interesting books. But what I didn't realize at the time was I was interested in books that were speaking to wealth creation and the wealth creation through sheer determination and perseverance. Um, I didn't realize that that was a pattern, but, but um, it was what it was. So maybe those books shaped me. Uh, my father was a business person. My mother was a nine to fiver. So a combination of seeing my father own his own business and do his thing and the books that I read, I can tell you that it shaped who I am today. Um, then post-secondary school, because at that time, when you're very good in the sciences, it's either engineering or medicine. And if you're good in the arts, you're being, you know, um, asked to study law and whatever course that there is, because it was all about the professional courses. So suffice it to say that I got into medicine and surgery with the intention of becoming a medical doctor. I don't know who told me. I don't know who told me that I could do it. So for one, I hate to see blood. I hate hospital till date, everything and anything that has to do with piercing needles, all of those things. I don't find them interesting, not at the very least. So I don't know why I thought I could do that. But hey, I found myself in medical school in university um, by my second year. By my second year, I knew that no way. I don't want to do this. I can't do this. I went home, I spoke to my father about it. He was understanding, he, he understood. Because somehow, by, <laughs> by stroke of coincidence, when he went into university, um, he had gone into study medical lab science, I remember, but he ended up studying economics and business administration. So he, he kind of found me <laughs> in the same dilemma that he was at the time that he left for the US, you know, for his university degree. So even though he was very understanding, my mom, a typical African Nigerian mom, oh, Ijama, you know, you can do this. You just don't want to focus. You just put your head down. You're going to get it, do it. And I went back to school and I continued, but <laughs> very like a desical attitude, uninterested, couldn't be bothered. And um, even though my parents 100% funded my education, um, but driven by financial independence, which I didn't know at the time, but I just knew that I didn't want to depend on people for the extras that I want in life. Driven by that, I got myself involved in mini businesses. There was this commercial city, Aba, for those of us who know Nigeria and the southeast of Nigeria is a commercial city. So, 
literally everything you want is in Aba. And there's this market called Araria Market. I would go to Araria Market during the strike, um, buy Damask. At that time, it was Damask. It was in vogue. <laughs> I would make sets of shoes and bags out of these. I'll sell them. Um, I did the Mary Kay business. That was the one that I really, you know, was into as a Mary Kay consultant. I was selling Mary Kay products. I also remember the the people who would come to either change curtains or beddings in our home at the time i got their contact i would make um you know beddings and duvets and pack them and sell to my cousins just sell to anybody i just loved the idea of making my own money i would buy gold jewelry sell to my mom and her friends she had no clue they my parents had no clue any of these things that i was doing while i was still a student uh, my mom, I would tell my mom that it, it belongs to a friend. Ah, you will have to pay this friend now. You can't owe the friend for so long. It was just one thing after another. Anything that would make me money. Um, then one time, I flew all the way to Senegal. <laughs> this was in the year 2000. I remember so clearly. This was in the year 2000. My goodness. I was 18. I hope my children don't hear this. But yes, I was 18 at that time. Went to Senegal unaided, unaccompanied, um, because Senegalese was in at the time. I bought I bought the the materials, I bought the fabrics, sold to my mom and her friends. They were my they were my customers, my very trusted customers. And my mom had no clue, no clue that she was buying things that belong to me but what did i know at that time what was i doing with that money because my parents funded my education a hundred percent in fact a hundred and one percent so looking back um i figured that that's where i started to express my quest for financial independence but then even going a bit further down i remember that at the age nine i remember that i would sit with my siblings at that time and i would have these ideas about owning a supermarket i remember so clearly that at that time, I, I named the supermarket Destiny Supermarket. And I would talk about this supermarket and, you know, at the age of nine. Um, but, well, I didn't make, it didn't make sense, right? But it was a dream. It was a passion. It was something. And I would spend hours daydreaming about this store with my siblings. Um, so, through my university days, I had lost interest in medicine and surgery. Um, I remember my second MB, the first time I flunked the three subjects, anatomy, um, biochemistry, and physiology. I flunked the three. But you had a chance to reseat this exam, to rewrite this exam a second time. I did it a second time by the next year, and I wanted to prove that I could. I mean, I was intelligent enough um, to, to pass my exams. I mean, I was four in primary one because I had skipped um kindergarten i skipped primary six so i got into secondary school at nine i graduated secondary school at 15 and i was in university at 16 so you know it was all of those things <laughs> and by age two for the life of me my father was already teaching me algebra 1a plus 1b i i started to i knew algebra and numbers from age two so i needed to prove that i was still this um, fast learning intelligent girl and i did the exam a second time I, I, I passed my anatomy with very flying colors. I, I passed my physiology. But then when it came to biochemistry, I knew that the only way to leave med school was to flunk one of the courses. And flunk it, I did. On the very day of the exams, I actually had my first contract where I was, I had to supply, it was Christmas hampers. So, I was, <laughs> I was engrossed in buying the products for these Christmas hampers and packing them, you know, and, and supplying them. It was, it was what was big to me. It was, it was major. And this was around the same year, 2000, 2000, 2001. It means I was still less than 20 and I had this contract at the time, so it was big. I remember something very interesting during my Senegal trip. Um, I remember getting there, French speaking. I knew nothing other than bonjour that I was taught in secondary school. I couldn't communicate. It was, oh my goodness, it was frustrating. I hadn't really lived outside of the East and outside of my culture. So even the food was strange to me. I had bought a ticket for five days, but I ended up shortening that trip. I paid, I remember so clearly, I paid an extra $100 to 
bring my trip forward and i spent only three days feeding on bread and fanta i could not eat anything else because i didn't know what couscous was and all of those you know and i'm not adventurous with food as adventurous as i am with everything else or as so much of a risk taker that i am when it comes to food um i like to play it safe so <laughs> i remember that about that trip and um when i even flunked out of medical school my intention was that i would be asked or allowed to then change to business college so it was so intentional i thought that i was going to be allowed to change it to business college and just go on with this whole thing that i love about financial independence and business and all of that well to my disappointment and dismay when i went to the college to you know to talk about the next steps they told me uh, there was no way i was going to change from medical school to business college first i didn't have the, that foundation and yada 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 and i had to graduate from medical school that was my first shocker i had to select um, one out of any of the preclinical courses trust me i went for the easiest the one that would not give me any headache and it was um, physiology so i graduated um with a bsc in physiology do i have any regrets i don't um however in hindsight in hindsight i could have graduated from medicine and surgery and just not practice because my problem was the practice because thinking of it right now it would have just been a nice ring to my name dr ijraman degree <laughs> just for that singular reason but aside that i'm loving my life in the way that it is i have no regrets so fast forward to um, post university i got married to my sweetheart like we were both beginners we, we didn't have um savings stashed up we were just beginners um, about to start life and and somehow i think that whole thing in me or about me that quest for financial independence, that thing that just says, I can't always depend on someone, you know, kicked in again. I mean, it never stopped, to be honest. And um, I realized, or I thought that it would be burdensome to expect my spouse, my partner, to carry all of the burden of a growing family. That, that was my thinking. and. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that thinking. So I got pregnant almost immediately with my first child. And I really, really, for the life of me, knew that I had to chip in. I had to come in as a partner. I had to do something. Um, I continued with my Mary Kay products, which I was selling, of course, from school. Um, I would go office to office selling this product. I remember that at one point I went to the market to learn how to make beads you know neck beads and all that and i sold them uh, because i was selling mary Kay products i remember there was this one time uh, i was offering makeup services <laughs> shockingly i actually did a wedding makeup too two wedding makeups for people just to earn money i did all of those things um and then i would so my my my, my spouse at the time would bring in stuff from the u.s so he used to sell cars so when the cars came in there would be clothes like second-hand clothes in the in the in the cars and i would go to the market to sell these items just anything to make money that was really um the beginning and um so of course because i used to sell jewelry as a student i had this love for jewelry so i I, <laughs> I think i spent all the money literally i had on jewelry so i had quite quite a few of jewelry and um by the time i was seven months pregnant i remember i made my first trip my first so my first business trip as a married woman um to dubai i sold my jewelry i sold all my jewelry raised a bit of capital and virgin nigeria had just announced its maiden flight so this was 16 years ago because my daughter is 16 yeah i think 16 plus years ago and i got on that flight i also remember that because of my protruding stomach i knew that i was going to have issues on the flight and all that i needed um you know i needed to have that fit to fly certificate or something 
I went to my doctor and I said, you don't have to tell a lie, but you don't have to exactly say <laughs> how many months or how far gone I am with my pregnancy. So we just kept the letter simple as to when I started antenatal. We didn't have to tell a lie. We didn't have to cook up anything, but we just, we were a bit evasive with the information that we had to put on there. So, um, I got to the airport and they were going to not let me fly. My goodness. <laughs> but somehow by stroke of luck or whatever you want to call it, I was on the flight and I went to Dubai with the intention to buy clothes and, and make money for the family and help the family, you know, financially. I remember that trip. I mean, the capital, the business capital that I had was next to nothing. I couldn't afford, um, you know, anything, <laughs> anything that even right now I'll consider decent. So in the Deira market, for those of us who know Dubai, for those of you who know Dubai, really, the Deira market has this, um, you know, hotels, very, very basic, very basic hotels that you could share rooms. So of course, you know, so it was like a hostel like thing, but where hotels right in the middle of the market, in the center of the market. So I would, I took one of those hotels where you would share rooms with three other people, just anything to cut cost, anything to make the money that I had, um, do well. But by the second day of walking around this market, I had edema, like my feet were swollen. Don't forget seven months pregnant, walking around the market. I had a guide. I had a guide who was taking me to the stores. Um, and you know, when it comes to business, they say you can't go wrong with the, the Maslow's law of man's basic needs, which is food, which is shelter and clothing. I, I picked the one that I felt, you know, made sense to me, which was clothing. And within clothing, I picked um, kiddies clothing. I thought that, okay. And maybe it's, it came from a, uh, from the fact that I was about to have a baby. So I thought I was interested in, in children's clothing and all. So that was what I brought in. By the time I came back, I realized, no, I don't have interest in children's clothing. And I remember, um, so I still went to the market, found some children's stores, sold a few to them, the ones that I could sell. I had a friend who said, oh, she could do that business and take it off me. And I shipped the, everything to her. Well, suffice to say that that money didn't come back, but it's okay. We move. And um, yeah, then of course my daughter came and all of that. Um, I still continued doing business. Uh, but at this time I knew it wasn't about children, clothing. I did everything that would bring money on the table. But by the time my, I had had my daughter, I would strap her on her car seat and continue going office to office. So I remember at that time, so people would save my name as Ijama Mary Kay. You know, because that was the, the main business that they knew me with. Um, from sourcing things in Dubai and all, someone then was also bringing in things from America. And um, I would buy of them, sell, you know, I started from my guest room in, in our home. I, that's where I started. And after a while, with the support of my spouse, I got a store, started, started, started the business, like business, business. And, but at this time I had transitioned into female adult wear from, from Dubai to people bringing things from America and I would buy them. I, I also transitioned, you know, I mean, business was growing. I moved to going to Europe to source things. So your Milan, Rome, Florence, Paris, Switzerland, um, I would go as much as four or five times in the year you know, to source, to source, um, goods for this business. And I was enjoying it. It was beautiful. I, I, I love fashion. I, I love to people. I love to see people dress up, even if I don't do the dress up myself, but I just love to see people well put together. And that was it for me. And that continued for a while, for years, but I ran into trouble with this same business. I had taken money from a microfinance bank and I couldn't repay. I couldn't meet up with the payment plans first because of course that's my only source of income so i'm making this money i'm i'm putting back in the family my own quota and all of that so i really couldn't repay and i remember this one time 
very active and, and that brings me to activity does not equal productivity um, you really can grow more than what you know you know but then don't despise the days of little beginnings um, as the bible um, says and i believe the bible <laughs> i'm a christian and i believe the bible so as much as you know i would say i didn't really understand the rudiments of building and growing a business but all of those experiences um combined you know has been helpful on this journey so i remember this day um the police came for the deaths and i was behind the counters for a day trying to secure bail and all that because i was owing so even though i had this business where people would come in you know buy stuff I wasn't making money i was selling i was selling there was revenue but i didn't have anything to keep so what was happening was i was spending out of the revenue not the profit right and in any business if you're not reinvesting the revenue if you want to take out money out of the business it should be from your profit not really from your capital even if that business is going to go down i have to chip that in and um so that was it it became i was i was enjoying what i was doing but family was growing i needed money bills were increasing the family needed money for a lot more things and i had dreams i was broke <laughs> so even though i was doing this business that kind of made sense oh boobers plays you know and all that i was broke i was broke 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 and um by 2012 i had gone to god in prayer in my prayer corner i remembered that there was this woman in the bible second kings chapter four precisely who had the same issue the same financial issues really you know and it was around debt um so for those of us who really don't know the story the background of the story is that this woman was married to a prophet and the prophet had debts and by the time he passed on um he couldn't repay the debts here the wife was or the widow was with her two sons couldn't repay these debts and the creditors had then come to take her two sons in Lien for the money that was being owed by her husband that was the story i took myself so this is not one of those cases where you say oh i'm the holy spirit but come to think of it the holy spirit directed me there because i knew that scripture so i went there in search of my own solution so yes it was still the holy spirit <laughs> that directed me there but i think what i'm saying is not one of those sensational moments where you stay and then it's like you heard a voice but i knew this um, passage in the scripture and i went to look for it to find my solution that said you know what your problems are so you have to be clear very very clear on what the issues are it doesn't make sense if you're having a health challenge and then you're you know um, building your faith uh, or growing in knowledge in the area of finance if that makes sense it's like find the root cause of your problem what are your issues what is that challenge that you're trying to solve and then go for light and when I say go for light, I'm saying go for knowledge, go for wisdom, go for trainings in that area. So be it in your career, there's a particular skill set that you need to improve on. What exactly is it? What exactly do you need for your next level? So that was exactly what it was for me. And in, that, in this case, it was how do I get out of debt? How do I just make this thing work? And um, I stayed on that scripture for about a week. And <laughs> as we'll say in the Christian faith, there was no rema, you know, for one week. So in the amplified version by the verse two of second Kings chapter four, it then said, what do you have in your hands of seal value? I remember that I had gotten angry with the Holy Spirit, um, technically. And I'm saying, listen, I don't know why you're keeping me on this scripture for this long. If there's nothing here for me, can I move? Because every day I went back to the same scripture. I just didn't think that I had gotten uh, my answer. And somehow, somehow, I knew that I would find my answer within that scripture. And in the twinkling of an eye, you know, um, when they say in the twinkling of an eye, really was the twinkling of an eye. I was in my prayer corner. I saw my fridge. My last baby was about six months at the time. I saw my fridge, I had pap in my fridge, which, which is the staple meal I give my children before, 
you know they turned to as toddlers that's that's what they really would take it was their it was their main cereal yeah so i saw pop in my fridge and i'm not saying i walked to my fridge i'm saying in my mind's eye like within a split second i saw pop in my fridge which was my son's food and i remembered that my sister who was living in another city a working mom because of her busy schedule she doesn't have the time to pre prepare um, pap for her son because she had had her first baby at the time as well so she would buy the ingredients she would buy the raw materials as it were and give to a woman who she felt was clean enough and hygienic enough um, to prepare pap for her son and in this instant as i speak i saw my fridge i remembered my sister and i just imagined how about i'm this woman to a lot other career moms other working moms who wanted to give their family and their children pap um but didn't have the time you know and also would not buy from the open market because they did not they did not trust um the sauce it wasn't hygienic enough for them and in that really 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 <laughs> in that light bulb moment in that moment i thought to bridge the gap between hygiene and convenience so it became a case of i'm going to make you hygienic pap and um, i'll get it across to you hygienically and that began the journey of my business boobies foods along the line something happened and my marriage packed up here i was struggling financially i then didn't have a husband with three children on the seven and i had to make life work <sighs> yeah <laughs> we'll continue in the next episode if you're watching this right now on YouTube, share with your friends, um, like the video, subscribe. This is my first, first, first <laughs> episode. I need your support to grow this channel, um, to fulfill purpose, to inspire others to dream, to inspire others to create wealth um, through entrepreneurship. To let us know that we can have it all. And that, like I said, your dreams are valid. See you in the next episode. Thank you.